Dr. Barbara Sherwood Lawler, Professor of Earth Sciences at the University of Toronto. Please give us a brief summary of your main area of study uh, and speak to its relevance to Canada's future economy. Well, I'm an earth scientist, a, a geologist by training, but I work at the intersection of geology, the study of the earth, chemistry and life, and specifically working on understanding the nature of the interaction between water on our planet and the life cycle. So as you can imagine, this ranges from all kinds of things, from understanding Earth's resources, all the way to understanding the nature of groundwater and the way that groundwater supports life on our planet. And in particular, our work was recognized for looking at remediation of near surface groundwaters that might be used for drinking water, and then all the way down to looking at water very, very deep in the planet that's un interacting with deep subsurface microbial life. And in some ways, the economic connection of that is very obvious. It comes as soon as you walk into your kitchen and turn on your tap. The need to have clean water, drinking water, agricultural water, water for industry and resource extraction. Water is essential to not only the natural life on this planet, but also to our constructed societies. And so we work very much there. We work very much understanding the nature of groundwater once it has been contaminated and how we can, by various means, remediate that contamination, recover and restore those resources. So I think the economic implications of that side of it are always fairly clear to people. Sometimes it's a little bit more of a stretch to help them understand why it is when we then move down into the earth, when we do our work two and three kilometers deep, looking at very ancient groundwaters deep within the planet. That kind of work that we do has implications for our studies on the origin of evolution of life, on planetary sciences, and on the search for life elsewhere in the universe. And interestingly, it too has all kinds of economic angles associated with it. In some of these cases, we're investigating new forms of life. So there are biotechnology and even pharmaceutical applications of that research. There's technology development because many of these deep subsurface sites that we investigate are analogs for how we might go about investigating other planets. And so instruments that might eventually, for instance, be flown to Mars or Enceladus or Europa can be tested out in these deep subsurface analog sites in which we work. There are implications as well for deep mining. In Canada, of course, the mining industry is a major part of our economy. And as the uh, expansion of mining to very, very deep exploration, there are direct connections between that and the research that we do as well. What does winning an award like the Killam Prize mean to you, to your team and to the work you've been doing for many years? When one looks at the list of people who have won this before, it's a very, very humbling experience because you look at extraordinary levels of achievement for Canada. You see some of your heroes reflected. And so it's, uh, it's, it's a so very sobering moment because it not only is a celebration of what the team working with us at the University of Toronto and our collaborators around the world have achieved so far, but as I always say, it's also a gauntlet. It's in one of these recognitions is really a, a challenge that says, okay, now, what are you going to do for us next? What I'd really like to know is where we are now in terms of, you know, protecting and restoring groundwater in Canada and what you think we can do to improve in this area. In Canada, we tend to know, and we even feed into our sense of natural, national identity, the idea that we're resource rich, that we have lots of water, that we have lots of resources. All of that is true. Unfortunately, if you take a look at report after report after report, you'll see that the other side of that is that we take our resources for granted. As Canadians, we assume that we have tons of clean water, that we know where it is, and that it's available to us. But in fact, again, as if you take a look at all the reports that have been done, you'll see that one of the biggest issues is we actually do not even at this point in time have a good idea of what the distribution nature and quality of our water resources are. And this is a big problem, particularly as we're moving into a very critical time period of climate change. We're changing climate, there are going to be changes in the nature of those water resources, changes in the distribution of rainfall and drought, and all of these will be hampered our ability to problem solve. How would you characterize the importance of interdisciplinary and often international research collaborations 
interdisciplinary science has become really the bread and butter. There's almost no one now who doesn't understand that if you have strength in physics, strength in chemistry, strength in geology, strength in biology, that given the complex nature of the questions that are facing us in today's world and economy, if you can bring all of those tools together in an interdisciplinary fashion, you're going to go farther, faster towards better solutions. So interdisciplinarity has become very much the watchword and is easy to sell, is easy for people to understand. Each nation funds its research nationally and there tends to be a knee-jerk reaction against the idea that any of those dollars that have been put forward might be used to work with a foreigner. Almost every country suffers from rate-limiting steps in trying to put together truly international collaborations. So ironically, for instance, I'll just give you a quick example. It's not that difficult for an international team to receive funding from their own country to come to do a research project, perhaps in the Canadian Arctic. And it might not be difficult for Canadians to get funding to go to the Arctic. But to get funding for both groups to work together is much more challenging. And so I do think we need to take a very careful look about the kinds of rate limiting steps or barriers that we build in to truly nimble and effective international collaboration. A couple of agencies are making great strides in that. CIFAR, for one, the Canadian Institute for Advanced Research is very committed to that and provides many of those kinds of catalytic ways of getting over those barriers. NSERC as well, I know, and some of the tri-councils are beginning to take a look at these things from a point of view of removing those rate limiting steps or speed bumps to international collaboration. But as we move forward, and particularly in the earth sciences, where we're examining the atmosphere, the oceans, these are not things that can be done just from within each nation. These are things that are going to require deep and effective and, I said again, nimble international collaboration. And how we do that in many places still remains a challenge. Considering the economic turmoil that Canada and the world are, are going through right now, um, do you have any concerns uh, for the ongoing funding for education and research in the coming years? Here we've seen a situation where there was an event that although was not necessarily, was, wasn't obviously going to happen, certainly there had been warnings that it could well might. And we'd seen previous incidents such as the SARS in 20, 2003. And yet, many steps were not taken. And that's often the case. How do we as society look at all the potential things that could happen, evaluate which ones are likely to happen, and then decide beforehand to actually take steps that will have a preventative impact or that will ensure that we are set up to adapt to adjust. What we've seen here, the silver linings to this terrible, heartbreaking period of our history, is that we have seen an enormous resilience in Canada from everyone to step up to the common good. We've seen a social license to recommit to the idea that we're all in this together and that we must find a way together. And suddenly, in the face of this crisis, all of the arguments about why we can't afford to change anything, well, all of a sudden, we're seeing the problems with that. All of a sudden, we're seeing the huge economic impact that comes about when you have not prepared for something. And so, in some ways, and this is something that I like to emphasize with the students, we can look at this COVID issue from the lens of other challenges that we are inevitably as a society going to face. In particular, the looming climate crisis. More than looming, the climate crisis is here, but looming are the enormously huge impact that that's going to have on our social activity, on our economic activity, on our future of both ourselves, our children and grandchildren. If we can take a look at that problem now and recognize in light of COVID that the economic impacts of doing nothing are actually enormously larger than trying to understand beforehand what might need to be done so that we're prepared for transformation, so that we're prepared to deal with a crisis. 
I think that what is happening within COVID provides us in some ways with a bit of a, a dry run for social crisis, a dry run for economic upheaval, and certainly a dry run for understanding what happens when we delay too long. Outside of your own area of work, what areas of research coming out of Canada's universities and academic institutions are you personally most excited about? That's really hard to pick because one of the fascinating things about Canada is we really have invested in, across the nation, breadth and depth. And that's one of the things I love about Canada is we've recognized that human potential really cannot be predicted. So it's extremely important to un make sure that we don't overpick winners, <laughs> that we recognize that everyone across the nation has enormous creative capacity and an ability to contribute, whether that's to education, to our homes and families, to health, to engineering or the economy. And so by investing broadly across the nation, we can hopefully provide the stepping stones to success for the largest segment of our population. And so in that sense, it would be difficult for me to pick because Canada is doing extraordinary things across an extraordinary number of playing fields. And um, But I think that that in some way does indeed reflect a continued social commitment to this idea of hopefully the greatest possible achievement for the greatest possible number. And uh, there are many places where that's not happening and uh, where we can identify that we are not putting in place the kinds of things that allow everybody to realize their full potential. That, that's really the areas where I think we need to take a very hard look. What must be done in your view to uh, inspire, to mentor, and to support Canada's next uh, generation? Canada's next generation is just uh, never ceases to inspire me. It's one of the reasons why I love working at universities, because you are inevitably surrounded every year by the next wave of incredibly committed, insightful, engaged, and still very positive young people. So I think the key thing is to help them retain that positivity. It can be so tough, particularly in the times like this, where it can seem like everything's falling apart around them, where their opportunities are coming constrained. And so I think here too, it can be extremely important to really emphasize, and you may laugh when I say this, but I'm going to say it anyway, the scientific method. The scientific method isn't necessarily about getting all the, the facts. You're trying to gain facts, but you're never going to get them all. It is moving towards truth, but you'd never necessarily get truth. The real scientific method is about testing and experimenting. And every test and experiment gets you a little bit further ahead, but most importantly, it shows you where you have gaps. It identifies failures. An experiment is inherently a lesson learned. And so any of the experiments, many of them tough, heartbreaking, experiments that we're going through right now in terms of the economy, the environment, the COVID crisis, Black Lives Matter, the problems with marginalized uh, parts of our society, all of these are actually opportunities for us to shine a stronger light on what's not working, because that's how we can learn and think about the actions that we need to take to move things forward. So the, um, the lessons learned aspects of even very terrible, terrible things can be a call to action, can be an encouragement to young people that this is where you can make a difference. And it can help to some degree, I hope, not only engage them to work as Canadians for change, for the things they believe in, but continue to make them recognize that change is possible. If you had 30 seconds to pitch someone in a position of power, who would you choose to pitch? And what would you say to strengthen and improve Canadian excellence in research? I would pick every Canadian. What we need to do is actually take a hard look at what we're doing now. And particularly, I say this as a card-carrying geologist. You know, as I mentioned earlier, we are rich as a nation in our resources, whether that's hydrocarbons, oil and gas, water, the land, the air. Change is coming. Transformation is essential. Transformation and the ability to nimbly move forward would be the fundamental underpinning of any business model. And yet, we're afraid. 
We're afraid to transform. We're afraid to change. We tend to look backwards. We tend to want to continue to do the things we've been doing. And yet everything is telling us that a good business model for Canada moving forward requires us to understand the drivers of disruptive transformation and invest in adapting to them and moving forward.